time is it there, Mick? Just got 9 p.m. Oh, okay. okay Ivy? Barbara, I think we are live. Ready for a nap. Oh. Well, good afternoon or good evening, everyone, depending on where you are. I'm Barbara Peters from the Poison Pen in Scottsdale, and my colleague Patrick Milliken and I are delighted to present Mick Heron's new novel, Secret Hours, and John Sanford, pictured in orange, just in case you don't know which author is which, is going to be um, doing the heavy lifting in the discussion. But I wanted to say I apologize for any of you who thought we were starting this event an hour earlier, because we were, except that I screwed up and forgot. So we had to move everything to one o'clock. It's all my fault. I really am sorry if I've inconvenienced everyone. But happily, the authors got the message. And so here we all are. And Patrick is going to put a buy link to the secret hours in the comments field, right, Patrick? So if you'd like to order a copy, um, you can certainly do that. And um, the British copies, I understand it. This book publishes in the U.S. on Tuesday, the 12th. And Mick, you said your book, because UK publication dates are on Thursday. So yours is the first one. Right. So you probably can't. Yep, you probably can't zip into your nearest bookshop and pick it up until next week. So we're here to tease you. I love it. <laughs> right. So, Patrick, what would you like to say? That's kind of my spiel. <laughs> Nothing. I'm just I'm just uh, happy to be here and able to uh, to listen. And I thought the, the book was absolutely brilliant. Um, you know, I, I don't really have a whole lot to add, except for uh, I'm looking forward to, to John's uh questions and um I'll, i might pop in with some questions as we go um but that's about it and everybody watching um if you have questions for mick or john uh and by the way we should say that john's new book is coming out uh, october well he'll be here on october 2nd uh to sign copies of uh, judgment pray right right, right. lucas right. and virgil together and it's actually, John's coming for our 34th birthday, and I ordered birthday cake yesterday, chocolate and coconut. So it'll be a party on Monday, October 2nd. Mick, we're only sorry you can't jet in to join us. You can send me some cake. <laughs> yeah, that'll work out well. We had a real memorable Bye. time a couple of years ago when uh, John and Mick were here in person, and it was a, a great old time. Um, but yeah, if you have questions for Mick or John, go ahead and put them in the comments field, and I'll be happy to to uh, ask some of those questions towards the end of the hour. But I'm I just have, gonna lurk and listen. <laughs> I have sort of a uh, procedural thing here that I need to mention to you guys. If I suddenly disappear, I don't know how to turn off my my uh, screensaver. And I, I think that, uh, that this app, um, uh, will keep going, but but if it doesn't, I'm going to have to, you know, touch a key or something like that. But if I just disappear, I'll be back. Okay. Well, that's okay. good to know. <laughs> and I, to came, I came home from voucher account with this really horrendous cough. So if I suddenly go silent or whatever it is, it'll be because I don't want to spoil everything. Mick, I would like to say before John starts talking that I thought the um, the chase scene at the beginning of this book was absolutely fabulous. It was very exciting. But what I really loved is the snark about the prime minister, whom, of course, we can all identify, even if you don't mention him by name. You mean Boris Johnson? That's the one. <laughs> Just leap straight in there. Right. So, John, over to you. Uh, okay. I was going to actually, actually ask you about Theresa May and Boris Johnson. I mean, you didn't really make a big effort to exactly conceal their identities, although you didn't mention them. Um, yeah, I, I rather enjoy the way that you mix actuality with with uh, fiction. Uh, one of the notable ones that you do is that there is no place called the park, as I understand it. Is that correct? That's right. Yes, um, Regent's Park or, or the park is um, part of the the world that I've invented. But the world that I've invented, I've kind of placed in in the real world. So the political background for for each of the novels is what it was at the time I was writing it. So while I don't tend to mention prime ministers by name, they can be identified by the, the year in which I read the book. And also, you know, other clues I might drop as to their identity. So All I right. mix it up really. I mean, it's 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 um, partly the real world, but I'm putting imaginary things happening in it. Mick and I uh, 
got together at the Ashmolean Museum, I think it was uh, early in the summer, and I asked him whether uh, the park was MI5 and MI6, to which he didn't have a specific answer. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's more MI5 than MI6, but I blur the boundaries between them because I don't want to pin myself down, really, if I want to start doing things that describing things that MI5 wouldn't do, you know, that MI6 would do. I'll just carry on and, and do it regardless. And uh, I'll, I'll let the pedants worry about how wrong I'm getting it. You know, I'm more interested in what the characters are doing. I don't want to abide by all the, the rules that they would, you know, be abiding by if they were real people. All right. Well, I uh, uh, maybe I'm a pedant, but uh, I have a character in the new novel who's from MI5. And mm -hmm. he actually has a romance with uh, with one of the characters in my book, Letty Davenport. Mm -hmm. uh, because he's uh, he, he refers to himself as somewhat fair haired. He's a former British soldier who is now uh, working for MI5. Um, and I wanted to thank you for all the kind of little fragments of information that you gave me that I've worked into the book. For example, uh, I didn't know that reading was pronounced reading and before I talked to you. So I've, I've, <laughs> I've I'm not sure that would matter on the page so much. <laughs> I just worked that in as a little parenthetical note in the book uh, when uh, Letty pronounces a reading. Um, all right. Uh, have you ever had a close encounter with a dead badger? <laughs> Not personally, no. I got that opening line from uh, my brother who lives in Devon. And we were uh, out for a walk together some years ago in one of the green lanes. Um, and he he just made that remark that the worst smell in the world is dead badger. And um and I, I, like, like you, I'm sure I'm a bit of a magpie. And uh, as soon as I heard that line, I thought, yeah, I can use that. And it became the starting point for, for the book. And, yeah, it, um, was, it, it was really very nice. I, uh, the fact that so many people were so appalled by the, by the odor of the dead badger. Did you, uh, uh, this book, I, I really like this book a lot, uh, but it's, kind of sideways from the slow horses books it's it's got the slow horses people in it and i and one of the things is that unlike a uh, some of the slow horses thrillers this one is it's got a strong element of mystery in it um which didn't get resolved for me until the very 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 end when i recognized a character um mm -hmm. and and uh i would like to know how you conceived of that how, how did you think of this whole thing? It, it came very, very gradually. I mean, the the um, the opening line was really the first thing I had. And that opening scene came very, very quickly. I, before I started writing it, you know, in, in my mind, um, I knew that I had the first chapter that it would involve this character who was woken in the middle of the night in his Devon cottage and chased down the green lanes by unknown assailants. And I knew he would be a, a former spy. I mean, 20 years retired and that something had come out of the past to um, to try and catch him. But I didn't know any more than that. So constructing the plot was um, was a, a sort of page-by-page -page process almost. I don't, I don't know about you, but I don't plan it all in advance. I mean, I have a certain number of things that I know are going to happen, but getting there is, is very much, I'm exploring the route as I'm walking it almost. And so it's the writing that I um, it's in the writing that I discover where the plot is is going. And this one surprised me because I had intended it to be a standalone. I was taking a break from the Slow House series, um, but I knew it was going to be in the same universe. So I knew that Regent's Park, which doesn't exist, was going to be in, in the new book. Um, and I knew that I was going to continue in my theme of bureaucracy and and, um, and thwarted ambition and so on. So I knew there would be a, a committee of inquiry set up to look into the misdeeds of the intelligence service. And I knew that this committee of inquiry was going to be, um, the people in charge of it were going to be uh, very upset, <laughs> essentially, because um, their careers were, were heading against a brick wall because the co committee of inquiry is going nowhere. It's been stymied right from the start by the intelligence service. And these people are, are, are getting nowhere with their investigations and they know that that's all it's going to be. And then a file falls into their hands, which they're not expecting. And that opens up an avenue of investigation, which they hadn't been expecting. And that avenue of investigation, of course, reveals who Max, the man who's woken up in his Devon cottage and chased down the green lanes, who he really is. 
but I hadn't known that I was going to be um, drawing quite so much on some of these stories that I'd established in the in the Slough House series. It's it's a standalone. It is a standalone, but there are Easter eggs, and I, I quite enjoyed putting them here and there. Um, and I think readers of the series will will enjoy the book because they will come to um, to recognise certain uh, certain figures and certain themes um, that the newcomers to the to the books won't. Did you know that you were going to use Molly again? Um, I knew that she was going to have a role to play in in the book um, because she is the archivist of um, of Regent's Park and. This was going to be a book about what went on in the past, so she was going to have a role to play that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, I, I tell you that uh, some parts of the book I found appalling, the events. Oh. That, <laughs> but uh, but uh, I did that. Um, let me ask you uh, a non-book question: How hmm. involved are you in the television series, and do you like the television series? I enjoy the television series very much. I think that um, the uh, that Apple TV and Seesaw, the production company that I work with here in the UK, have done a great job, and um, far more so than I had any right to expect, really. Because they've been enormously faithful to the books, not necessarily in the plots, although they have been fairly faithful to the plots, but in the characters. They've taken the characters and they've preserved them as they are. They've kept the mood and the tone of the novels and they've gone um, the extra mile to to uh, to make it an authentic experience for those who know the books. So, for instance, when you see um, an exterior shot of Slough House, the place that I call Slough House, that's the actual building that I used to walk past every day on my way to work. That's the building that I chose to to put my characters in. So it is the real Slough House. I mean, it's not really a department of the intelligence service. It's just a building, but it's the one that I intended, um, the one I always think of as my characters. Uh, that's where they are. That's the the house that they inhabit. Excellent. So, I, um, I, uh, sorry, Karen. I do exactly the same thing, so I'm very familiar with that. <laughs> you, uh, Gary Oldham, uh, Gary Oldham, seems to me to be a brilliant choice for uh, for Jackson Lamb. He is um, because he's one of the great character actors of our time, and he absorbs himself into a part or immerses himself in in the role. So he. Um, before he started playing it, we had conversations on the phone and he was asking me uh, questions that had never occurred to me. He wanted to know what Jackson Lamb keeps in his fridge, you know, and that, that level of granular detail that he was he would go into. He wanted to know what school, um, what kind of school Lamb had been to. These are things that I've never addressed in the books because... What kind of school? In a sense, well, I, we, we decided that he was probably a grammar school boy. Okay. Um, he certainly is not public school. Um, which would be, you know, private school in American terms. Um, but these aren't things that I've particularly thought of before, because for me, Lamb is just how he appears on the page. He is where he is now, and I haven't given a great deal of thought to um, to uh, the, the the deep backstory. But it's very important to Gary that um, that he knew these details because he uh, he absorbs them into the performance that he's giving. Of course, what was most important to me, or at least a, a, a really thrill for me was the fact that he had played George Smiley in, uh, in the movie of Tinker Taylor some years ago. So to have the same actor doing both those roles was extraordinary to me. Um, and Gary himself has great fun with that idea. He's spoken of how he sees Jackson Lamb as being George Smiley, having made a few wrong decisions along, along the road. Well, but you hint, you hint toward the end that he may not have made some wrong decisions. You probably don't remember this, but uh, when he is talking to Diana Taverner at the end of the book, uh, she makes reference to that, and he says, "Well, it's early days yet." Meaning, <laughs> there's always um, always room for uh, the maneuver. I think in these books, yeah. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to mention to the viewers who are watching this one. I, I thought one of the more uh, uh, extraordinary uh, thing about this was the was the opening thing is uh, done by Mick Jagger, um, and I I I just wonder how you recruit Mick Jagger to do the opening thing for a TV show. Well, I think you get very very lucky. Um, the the producers were keen on having a, a, a London 
voice uh, for providing the the theme song, whatever that would be. And of course, when you think of London voices, particularly at the sleazy end of the scale, then Jagger is one of the most obvious choices you can make. And um, the uh, the musical director Daniel Pemberton just reached out to him to find out whether he'd be prepared to do this. And it turned out that Jagger had read the books, so he was he knew what they were talking about and, and was was fine with it. He agreed straight away. Um, and this was all done during one of the lockdowns, I think. I believe he recorded it on a, 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 over a mobile phone, but um, I'm not entirely sure of the, the full details of that. Uh, but yes, Jagger was uh, was delighted to do it. Apparently, I've never met him. Um, but the the rest of us, the the producers, and Will Smith, the lead writer on the show, we were completely thrown by this. We were blown away. We had a. a they told me on a. On a conversation over the telephone what had happened and not that simply that you know Jagger had agreed to do it but that essentially he'd already done it and it was happening you know it, it would be the the theme tune for the for the show and we had one of those conversations where we just on the phone just repeated the name Mick Jagger over and over again to each other because we couldn't quite believe what we were what we were talking about oh, that was yeah. one of those things that came out of the blue I find that um, in both in publishing and and my slim experience of the TV world is that everything happens very, very slowly over a long period of time. Um, and, you know, when when we knew that Gary Oldman was going to play the part, his name had come up a number of times and everybody knew that discussions were taking place. So when he signed up for it, you know, it was, it was great. We were all absolutely delighted, but we'd all been kind of waiting for that, either the yes or the no, you know, it was all, it was all there happening very, very slowly. Whereas with Jagger, you know, the first thing we knew was, yes, he's doing it. It's, it's, it's done. It's, uh, it'll happen. So. You actually, uh, do you actually work directly with the writers of the show? Do you write yourself or suggest scenes or possibilities? Um, I work in the writer's room. I haven't written any of the scripts, but uh, in the writer's room, as you, you're probably aware yourself, a lot of the planning takes place. So we have a, a, a white wall and um, over the course of three or four weeks, and I'm not there every day, I'm just there a couple of days a week while the room is up. And by the end of the, the, the period, um, that wall will be covered and it will have a scene by scene breakdown of all six episodes of, of the show that we're working on. And um, there's a strange kind of alchemy goes on because often it seems like there's no real work happening. We're just talking to each other and there's a lot of laughter and everybody's having a great time, it would seem. And yet somehow all these decisions get made and, um, uh, and and it just sort of evolves almost, I mean, it's not doing it by itself, but it kind of feels that way sometimes. Um, so it doesn't really feel like work, and yet the work does get done all the same. And this is where all the decisions are made about um, any changes we might be making to, to the novel uh, and to the way the story is told. Because, of course, novels, it's mine certainly, and, and most other writers' novels, are largely depend a lot on interiority. So I'm inside my characters' heads all the time and saying what they think and how they feel about the things that are going on. You can't simply do that on the screen. You need to find different ways of, uh, of getting the information across about what people think and feel. Um, but blessed with, with a fantastic cast, though, I have discovered that, um, you know, a close-up on an actor like um, Saskia Reeves, she can... She can portray a lot of inner turmoil just in a you know a three second close up, something that would take me a whole paragraph to uh, to describe. So there's a lot of give and take in a way between you know what what's in the book and, and can't be put onto the screen, but what the actors are bringing to to the storytelling. Um, and some of that, not all of it, but I mean, some of that takes is worked out in in the writers' room uh, where we do the scene scene by scene breakdown. So where we've departed a lot from the from the novel, where the plot changes. Um, I've always been there when those decisions are made or been there to discuss them uh, as the, after they've been made. And I'm absolutely fine with all of them. They, um, there are many occasions where I think they improve on, on uh, what I did in the book. My, uh, uh, my wife and I are uh, both former newspaper reporters. And, uh, and, and then I got into the book writing business and she went to Los Angeles. This is before we were uh, associated with each other. She went to Los Angeles and she wrote a screenplay, which was made into a movie. And mm -hmm. uh, so we've talked about that afterwards. And one of the things is her movie was a hundred double spaces, uh, double spaced pages long. My books are like 300. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and and uh, and a lot of the stuff that's in the hundred pages of the script is just you know kind of directions. It's not actually di or not actually substantive. Uh, and so we've talked about that a bit. And one of the things that came up was something you just mentioned. Uh, so much of it is hung on actors and how they behave and how they look mm -hmm. and what direction they're going in and what their tone of voice is and all that kind of stuff. I have never watched a movie production, but uh, when I became, when she made me aware of that, I became kind of astonished about the, about the way that works. We have to describe it as novelists to mm -hmm. tell people what's going on, but in a movie, it's just, uh, it's like magic that happens with the actor. Or and a no. lot of it is comes with the direction as well. I think it's um, how a director is steering an actor can provide a lot of that, uh, a lot of what the, the material that they're, they're working with. Um, and a lot of it is, is context, I suppose, how an actor is responding to what's going on around him. I've enjoyed seeing the actors. I've been on set quite a lot. I enjoy seeing the actors uh, working at, um, at bringing something new to the script. I've, uh, as you probably know, when you're seeing something being filmed, you see the same thing happen over and over again. A, a scene, short clip of dialogue will be filmed 15 times, 16 times, so that they get different angles in and um, and they have all the all the material they need so that they can edit it to, you know, what's looking like a very smooth, continuous piece of uh, piece of film is actually cobbled together from all sorts of different places. And watching some of the actors work, I watched a pair of actors delivering the same lines over and over again, 15, 16 times, as I say. And one of those actors said it in exactly these lines, in exactly the same way, every single time. And the other one did it differently every single time. And it was really interesting to see the, those different ways of working. You know, one actor who thought, this is how I'm doing it. This is, you know, how I want this scene to go. And the other one constantly looking for a different way in, a different way of expressing himself. Not even using the same words all the time, you know, the, the lines would become scrambled a bit and it, it felt very authentic each time, you know, because it's almost like he was finding the words rather than simply performing something that he learnt off by heart. So all the actors have different ways of uh, of doing this and what they bring to the screen can can vary greatly. But it's um, it's fascinating to see a coherent whole made out of all these hundreds and thousands of different little parts that, uh, that are going on throughout the filming process. Um, let's get back to the book, uh, back to all your books, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, the first four or five books you wrote were not slow horses books. They involved, sometimes in a very odd way, this woman, Zoe Bohm, is that the way you pronounce her name? Bohm, that's right. Yeah. Her last appearance, I think, she was dead. So... <laughs> That struck me as odd. You have a, a way of killing off major characters. Zoe was one of them. Um, Cole was another one of them. Uh, and uh, I'm very, very worried about uh, about uh, Cartwright. Uh, mm -hmm. about River Cartwright. Is, is River, Cart River Cartwright, you hint that he's alive, but there may be something seriously screwed up about him. Are, are you going to continue killing off major characters? Uh, probably is the answer. I mean, as long as I keep working on the series, I've always felt that um, one of the advantages of having a, a large cast of characters is that I can I can do just that. I can write some characters out and bring new characters in all the time. I think of it as having a revolving door. Um, so the series gets refreshed, as it were, because I can have new characters that I can play around with. But I, I miss I miss characters when they do when I do write them out. It's not that I believe in them. I mean it's not as if I think that they are real people. They're not flesh and blood. Uh, but each of them represents a different tone of voice, a different mode of thought, if you like. And once I kill a character, then I can no longer access that that voice. You know, I have to uh, I have to do without it. I can't can't recreate it uh, anymore. So it's it's something that I find myself not regretting, but um, I'm quite wistful sometimes about the characters who are no longer there. But it's important to me that I that I do that because although I'm writing about um, uh, characters, spies who are, have been um, marginalised and are no longer taking part in the in the, um, the the big rough and tumble of the wide world, you know, they're not out there on on dangerous missions or anything. They nevertheless are involved in a business that does involve protecting the the nation if you like 
And it's a dangerous business. And, you know, people do get killed in this line of work. So I didn't want to pretend that that doesn't happen. Uh, we have to, if ironic thrills, we have to accept that there is danger involved. And if the characters are writing about always evade the danger and they never suffer at all, then it stops being it stops being dangerous for the reader and it stops being authentic perhaps but you know this because you've you've killed characters off yourself so it's it's something that um that writers do and you presumably don't feel very happy about uh, about saying goodbye to characters but nevertheless it's it's part of the world that you're working in i'd ask you not to kill off uh, roddy ho or shirley <laughs> <laughs> i i get that a lot in public events yeah, people people tell me don't don't kill so and so, don't kill another one, and I always say that um, I hadn't been planning to, but that does sound like a good idea. Now that you mention it, well, I I, I really like Roddy Ho. I like him both in the TV series, but especially in the books because he's such. Uh, it seems like he's people you know. It seems like I've run my <laughs> past. I'm, I'm can I jump in just for a second? I just wanted sure. to ask a, a quick question about um, about the kind of, of the, the monochrome inquiry and mm -hmm. in the book and how it, how it functions and is it is that a real thing? Can you talk about about that? There's no um, reality really in, in the stuff that I'm writing. There's I hope there's plausibility. Uh, I've got no idea how government inquiries work. Um, but I do know that if I'm going to write about a government inquiry, then I have to invent certain things. So there are, you know, um, there's legislation quoted, you know, and paragraph numbers of particular acts of parliament. I'm making all this up, but once you put those in, it starts to sound real. Uh, and I invent all the protocols and all the um, the, the, the forms and, and formats that that, an, uh, that a panel of inquiry like this has to undergo, because it's it's all bureaucracy. It's all about the fine print it's all about all these tiny petty volume details that um that have to be fulfilled and as i say it's all it's all invented but the the political and social climate and where in intelligence and politics intersect all of that is, is largely true i hope or at least is based on based on reality and what i'm trying to do is is create something that sounds like it could easily be happening i mean this is an inquiry that gets stuffed up right from the start because the intelligence service puts a spoke in it in their wheel and um and so the the characters who are running the inquiry the two civil servants griselda flight and uh, malcolm kyle are, are essentially in the same position as the slow horses in the in the slow house novels you know they they know that there's nothing really they can do they're just um they're spinning their wheels you know they're they're filling out all this paperwork and they're going through the motions and they know that there's no real material coming their way because they're not allowed access to any of it uh, so when a real file does come their way, they they jump on it. Um, it's not necessarily the the wisest decision they might make, but after two years of of um, wasting their time essentially and seeing their careers drizzle away in in, in boredom and frustration, they um, they feel the need to to do something. Right. So you know when you uh, uh, when you create some references to characters that we make assumptions about their identity. Uh, I'm talking about the prime minister and, and uh, you know, the prime minister used to be the foreign minister. And uh, we know that there's a case like that in recent history. Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious about Anthony Sparrow. Did you know that man or know somebody like him? <laughs> or, or, Anthony is he, Sorry? or is he just, is he just somebody we know exists? He's somebody we know exists, I think. I mean, he's a character who had appeared in the the last, uh, there are intersections, there are overlaps between this book and, and the, the Slough House series. He appeared in a novel about actors. Um, he's a government spin doctor, really, and he's loosely based on a, a, quite a number of people, actually, who would all... Um, Unelected uh, officials who have are wielding greater power over government and in government than uh, than they ought to, given given that uh, none of the electorate ever voted for them or had any, any choice about the the roles that they're they're playing. So I'm I'm quite interested in this idea that you know so much of what goes on in terms of government um, is just wished upon us. It's got nothing to do with democracy. It's got to do with the uh, with expedience of those who who have been elected to power and the methods they are choosing to to cling onto that power. 
uh, you know, the, the spin doctors there point who uh, who could show them how to how to continue even um, even when the the, the methods they're choosing are uh, are not for the benefit of the country at large. I'd like to stick in a comment and say how sure. much I enjoyed the character referred to as first disc. I mean, this is a really wily and amazing woman, but it also, as you read through the book, you recognize that while she may be a top spy, although actually in my five is not exterior spy in real life, um, but but the real the real thing is how to survive the bureaucracy that she's working in, and she seems to me to be a brilliant tactician. I mean, she's just like von Clausewitz or somebody, you know, <laughs> parading away. I was so impressed with her. Um, you know, do you? I mean, one of the questions that that keeps coming up, Mick, in um, in all the books that have come out in the last few years, because there's sort of like a whole wave of them, about what women did in the war, in World mm -hmm. War II, and how difficult it was for women who had done really amazing things in the war, you know, run companies and, I mean, you know, to go back to sort of being, you know, 1950s housewives. So mm -hmm. is First Desk an example of how um, women overcame that and, you know, are now on an equal footing with men in the machinery of government? I suppose if you take a long term view, then yes, you, you could argue that. I'm not sure that women are on an equal footing with, with men in, uh, in government or anywhere else, really. But I do think that individual women are and have been over the past um, few decades that have achieved um, positions of, uh, of power that they would never have been that would never have been available to them, you know, 40, 50 years ago. So the war did change a lot of that. A lot of what women did during the war to help win the war for the Allied cause remained secret for, for a long, long time afterwards. Um, I'm thinking about places like Bletchley Park, where the Enigma Code was, was cracked. Most of that work was done by women, none of whom were able to tell their story until many, many years after, and many of them went to their, went to their graves without having revealed even to members of their family what it was they'd done, what they'd done to win the war. Um, so the, there's always been that kind of buried um, history there. Uh, men with all the medals and, uh, and get all the glory, but um, often it's been women doing all the work. And I suppose the same is largely true of domestic life often. Well, I I'm interested in... Uh, I'm interested in, in writing about women in... strong women in positions of power. and um, But also a lot of that is exploring how like men they behave um, in order to achieve those positions and uh, in order to maintain themselves once they are there. Uh, because organisations demand that kind of behaviour, it seems to me, um, and they can they can uh, not necessarily force, but certainly encourage people into behaving in ways that aren't necessarily honourable or, or moral, but um, are the ways that one behaves if one wants to remain in position of power. And one of the things I think about the first desk character is that um, she does think she's the best person for the job and she does think she's doing a good job. And I, I sort of agree with that. You know, I, I think she is. But the, you know, the means and the methods that she adopts are not, are not things that I would necessarily endorse. No, but she's really a formidable fighter. And, you know, this has come up quite a lot recently in discussions we've had at the store about how seriously people took the Official Secrets Act, which would not even be possible today. I mean, you know, with social media and all the rest of it, leaks occur every single day. Um, and, and really, it's almost as though it were centuries ago when you read about how, you know, how people believed that that oath mattered and that they kept those secrets, as you say, mm -hmm. many of them all the way to the grave. Um, so it, it's um, it's not even been a century since the war, but it feels like a much bigger divide. Technology has revved everything up. Anyway, sorry, John, back to you. <laughs> I didn't, no, I was I was pretty interested in what you're saying. So if you got more, <laughs> go ahead. let me. Uh, does your wife get involved in the production of the books? Joe, uh, no, she um, she's my first reader, and, um, and she's very, very supportive and encouraging of everything I do. But I write very privately. I um, I don't show anybody what I'm doing. I don't really talk about what I'm working on until it's done. Until I'm I've, I have a draft that I think is is readable. Um, I don't even talk to my publisher about the books that I'm writing. I don't tell them the title until I <laughs> they really force me to, um, because I've always found. 
writing to be that kind of to be something best pursued in private i know a lot of writers who write in public who write in cafes who can write on trains who uh, who are quite happy to talk about their their work in progress and who will you know, read bits of their work in progress uh, aloud at, at events uh, but it's it's alien to me it's not the way i can work at all i think until something is finished i always feel that it's it's best kept hidden because um until I finish polishing it, I don't want anybody to look at it. How do you approach that? Does 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 Michelle read what you're writing as you're writing it? She's my first reader. It's a, I, I do exactly what you do. I, I sit over to a room and and I write the thing, and uh, and I'm annoyed when the publisher calls me and say, well, you know, we've got to do some pre publicity or something like that. So what's it about? Mm -hmm. And, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes I'm 70,000 words into it. I'm not sure what it's about. Yes, yeah, it's quite, it's quite. Do you hate writing, having to write a sort of blurb for them? Uh, it's, yeah. I can't stand that bit. Yeah, it's it's, it's awful. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, uh, there's a... There's a I, I can't... You know, I'm, I'm so stuck in your universe there, and I'm, I'm mm -hmm. just very intrigued about the way you drag these people through that the fact that Zoe Bohm wound up in a, I think, in a couple of of Slow Horses books, or at least one, um, and that these other people go through these things, and you say that you, when you work, you're working, uh, you're working by, you know, you're working by yourself, and, and you don't know exactly what's going to be coming next. And and but these people come through your books, um, uh, so you don't know what people are going to be in your books before you. <laughs> oh, I, I, usually, I, I usually know that bit. Yeah, I have um, sort of plot points that are, that I know are going to occur, and I have a destination in mind. It's the route, really. I don't know what route I'm going to be taking to get there. Um, I do enjoy the idea that having created a. A set of characters i can kind of move them around a bit in in, in different directions um in ways that i'd never intended to use them when i first came up with them so uh the characters do it's not so much that they surprise me but i um i realize that i can make more of them than i had originally intended um and that's something that i find enjoyable and it's um it's a consequence of of having written quite a lot by now it's not something that you can do, you know, when you've only got two or three books under your belt. But you're doing very much the same, John. I mean, the, the recent books, um, now that uh, they've got Letty up and running as a character on her own, and you've reintroduced Virgil into into Lucas's world. I mean, they were always in the same place, but now they're they're um, they're on the page together in a way that they haven't been in quite a while. Was that something that you had planned a long time ago, or is it something that's just kind of grown organically out of uh, uh, just, I, I, i've written i've written so many books now that um that i'm getting tired of uh, i'm getting tired of 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 uh having them be separate because if i put them together then maybe i can write a standalone book sometime with which the <laughs> publishers really don't want what the publishers really want you to do is to write the same book over and over and over and over again as long as they keep selling and then you know and so uh, it's gotten to be a bit of a struggle, but I personally, uh, while I'm not going to leave them behind, I would like to do a few, you know, uh, standalone books before I shuffle off the mortal coil. Um, oh, well, that's a long way away. Uh, maybe. Let me, uh, you're much younger than I am. So uh, Malcolm, the character Malcolm in this book, uh, he saw, this is, I, I don't mean to ask <laughs> I don't mean to throw an impertinent question at you, but Malcolm is a bit of a fool. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. he he brushes his hair and he pulls, you know, hairs out of his nose and he does all these things because his parents told him that he should be, you know, neat. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, but the thing is, you went to Oxford, you went to Balliol, I guess, and uh, and Malcolm went to Cambridge, and I just wondered if the, if any of the old competition. <laughs> Uh, happened to be exist there did you pick cambridge instead of oxford as his uh, point of origin I, I don't remember doing that deliberately no um malcolm is a character i i like characters who whose flaws are very obvious whose um uh whose weaknesses are all there available on the surface and he's a very neurotic individual 
and not terribly self-aware. I mean, he's convinced himself that he's a, a high flyer. And he has done, you know, reasonably well in his career up until the point I start writing about him. But not as well as he likes to imagine. Otherwise, he would never be put in the position that he is in the book of being seconded to this inquiry that everybody knows is, is going nowhere. But also that gives me the opportunity to have, have the worm turning, as it were. I mean, he's somebody who has generally done everything that's expected of him, always does what he's told, always likes to look neat in, in public and make sure that he's making the best impression that he possibly can. Uh, and he's realised that none of these things have helped him. You know, they haven't rescued him. They haven't um, kept him from a, you know, sort of bad career choices being made for him, not, not ones that he's necessarily made for himself. So ultimately, he just thinks, well, none of that is doing me any good, so I might as well um, might as well just follow my own head for a while. And that's when he goes off on this investigation that uh, that, that monochrome uh, end up embarking upon. Right, John, let me let me just pop in here for a minute. I am possibly the only person besides Mick on this screen who's actually read all of Mick's books in real time because we import British books um, to the Poison Pen. And I loved your Oxford series and I like you know some of your standalones. And I've been interested watching you evolve as a writer and how your characters um, you know, over the years have gotten more complex or, you know, whatever it is. It's been fun to watch you from the very beginning or to read you. I shouldn't okay. say watch you. Um, but I wanted to ask um, before we lose track of time, your publishing career, you've come to an interesting place with a publisher, a smaller publisher that you took the um, the Slough House series to. And, you know, why was that? I think that's an extremely interesting decision you make to to choose a small publisher as opposed to some of the larger ones in the UK. And what effect has that had? On, is it Baskerville? Do I have that name right? Uh, Baskerville is an imprint of John Murray, which is yes, uh, one of, I mean, it's part of Hachette. I mean, ultimately, it's part of a huge right. publishing industry, but it is one of the smaller publishers. Uh, I didn't take the books to John Murray. They came to me and okay. asked if um, uh, I uh, would... Uh, allow Soho Press to lease the UK rights to them. Um, I've never really paid much attention, <laughs> maybe not as much as I should have done, to the business side of uh, uh, publishing and, and writing. I always just wanted to go on with, with writing the books. And so all of that happened, um, not without my knowledge or consent, but it was all something that was happening without a huge amount of involvement on, on my part. I was just hoping that uh, I would be allowed to continue to write books and that, um, you know, they, they would find, you know, a readership somewhere. But with John Murray, um, they found a far greater readership in the UK than I was ever expecting or that, um, that, that there'd been any indication was, was out there. I thought I was writing books for a really sort of niche audience and that was sort of special interest because they're, they're thrillers, sort of, but they're, they're not big rambunctious blockbuster type thrillers. They're thrillers about sort of thwarted people leading, you know, sort of stunted lives in many ways. I think um, you're an interesting example of authors, you know, who write different kinds of books and then one day they they elect to write a series character or something special. And it really changes the direction of their career because you wrote quite a few books before you wrote the first The Slough House series. Um, and, you know, I find it fascinating that, um, and, and I, I've never been able to work out, I had a discussion with a new author last night at the bookstore about, you know, sometimes books hit the zeitgeist, sometimes a new direction hits the zeitgeist at a moment that makes it um, sort of like foam up as compared to, you know, the things that you've been writing before. I always think of Rex Stout, John, I mean, you might, or Patrick could check on me, but I'm pretty sure that Rex Stout wrote something like 49 books before he wrote the first Neuro Wolf book. Imagine. Is that right? Yeah, Good I book. think so. I could go back and check. But anyway, mm. he wrote a lot of books. And then one day he thought of Neuro Wolf. And, mm. you know, I, I think of you a little bit that way because, you know, you were more an obscure writer. I, I brought your books in for me, not necessarily mm. to sell to the general public because I love that. Mm. Remember the one that starts in a school? I can't remember the name of it, but it was just like, oh. yeah. Reconstruction. Yeah, um, absolutely loved it. And so one day, suddenly, there was all this buzz about the, you know, the Slough House series. And I thought, yay. Well, that's that's very kind of you. That, that's lovely to hear. But although I think there was a way, in a way, um, Slough Horses did 
connect with the zeitgeist. It wasn't until sort of six or seven years, certainly on, on this side of the Atlantic, six to seven years after it was published before that really happened. Um, I think that it was it's sort of post-Brexit over here. Um, the books suddenly felt more in tune with the times we were living in than they had done before. So a lot of it is, is political, really, and a lot of it is chance. Um, yeah, the, the book was first published, Slow Horses was published 13 years ago. I mean, it's selling very well now, but it didn't sell very well at all for the first five or six years of its uh, of its life. Well, there's a certain discovery, I think, thing that also has to happen, you know, kind of word of mouth. John, you've had such a different experience. I mean, you know, you've, you've had an amazing thing with Lucas and then, you know, Virgil and all, but you were so well known for in the beginning, it was a different path. I read Rules of Prey back in the 80s, yeah, and yeah. I've kept up with John ever since. Mm. But, uh, you know, one of the things about uh, about your books, I, I know that you were an English major, I guess, in in, uh, in college. Um, your books have a literary feel to them. I mean, they have a, uh, I mean, you, you know, your phrasing, uh, your use of words, uh, your kind of like clever dialogue. It has a, it has a, um, uh, it it just it just it just feels more literary than the stuff that, uh, for example, I do, and uh, and I think that's generally the case uh, with a lot of British writers uh, who I think are generally more uh, more creative than American writers um, at the at, at the current time at any rate. Who do you read? Uh, what British writers do you read? You read? Uh, are you reading The Wasteland or 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 you know mm -hmm. fairy tales or something like that when you're not? <laughs> or do you or do you read the other guys who are writing thrillers in England and usually very well? Um, I read a lot. I mean, most of what I read is fiction. Not all, but most of it. Um, and it's um, probably about half is genre fiction, and the other half would be mainstream literary fiction. Um, I've just finished reading Zadie Smith's new book, The Fraud. That's the novel I was reading last week, which I thought was absolutely tremendous. I thought it was a wonderful book and not something that I would be capable of writing in, in any way, shape or form. Um, the thing about genre novels, I find, is that they have more of a, offer more of a framework to a narrative. You know that you're going to be working towards a finale and you know, towards some kind of closure and, uh, and resolution in a way that mainstream literary fiction doesn't necessarily do. So, um, so it's a, a bit of both. I mean, I do enjoy, I enjoy going off on flights of lyrical fancy here and there in, in, in writing. I do enjoy what I, uh, exploring language and the way that it works, but what genre fiction offers me and what the great writers of genre fiction offer me, are they the kind of, narrative um, thrills that you get, just the, the satisfactions that you get from seeing things slotting into place along the way. Uh, currently, the um, narrative, re uh, the, the genre readers that I um, admire most, um, my mind always goes blank at such moments. I mean, I do uh, still read um, Le Carre, who is uh, one of the greatest uh, of all spy writers ever. Le Carre did British spy fiction the writers of British spy fiction who followed him a great favour because he showed that um, spy novels could be taken seriously as, as works of literary art. And I think as a result of that, many of us who followed in his footsteps have been taken more seriously than, uh, than might otherwise be the case. So a lot, of, um, a lot of contemporary spy writers do lean on actual historical events that they then twist to their own uses. Uh, right, like John Lawton, for instance, who takes... Mm events during the 20th century and creates um, uh, narratives around them, which I find very, very satisfying. A lot of writers now are looking back to the Second World War, recent books by Kate Atkinson and uh, Amanda Smith, Amanda Scott, sorry, um, have drawn on the experiences of women uh, in special operations, executive and, and the like during the Second World War and, uh, and use them as the basis of, of uh, novels. And I find that fascinating as well. I don't tend to do that. I don't tend to draw on history very much, um, but I do enjoy reading that a lot. You, uh, I draw on the contemporary rather than t historical event, but I do enjoy reading about historical event. Have you read the Flashman novels? Long time ago, yes, not in a while, but yes, they were good fun. Yes, sir. Quite interesting. Mm. Uh, in, the, in the book that I'm writing now, uh, the sections set in Oxford, I've invented a General F. And Stone 
uh, in. Uh, why General Effenstone, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, was uh, widely regarded as the worst general in the history of uh, of the British Empire. <laughs> and there's a lot of competition for that. Yeah, there might be, but I mean, I think that he's got a pretty strong claim on it. Uh, I, mm-hmm. He was in one of the Flashman books, and that's why I picked him up. Um, right, right. And, uh, but uh, I, I think uh, I, I just I've just found it interesting the way. Uh, well, Le Carre, uh, I found Little Drummer Girl to be amazing. I just yes. I, I really liked that book, but I didn't like uh, I didn't like some of his other books. Uh, do you do you feel a little abashed by the idea that people are saying you know he's the second coming of Le Carre? He's the best spy writer in the world. He's the best thing that we've had since Le Carre. Or do you think you might be just like a little notch above Le Carre? <laughs> Not above. No way. Um, I do think that this is almost inevitable because um, reviewers and critics like to lean on whatever whatever was in recent history to look at what's um, what's coming next. You know, they like to see kind of straight lines um, between authors of you know ten twenty years ago and authors of now. Uh, there'll never be another John Le Carre because he was completely irreplaceable and, and unique, and not only because of the way he wrote, but because of the times he lived through. He was this was a man who actually saw the Berlin Wall going up, and that was the kind of experience that seeps through into the novels that he wrote, particularly the Cold War novels. And uh, you couldn't do that. I couldn't do anything like that now. Nobody could. You know, he, he was completely irreplaceable. I'm not right I, if i could write a book like tinker taylor i would i mean without a doubt i can't I, I i can't plot like that i can't write like that so i make a virtue of my limitations and i've created my own little world in which i can do what i like with these characters who are all quite limited they're all they're, they're all um, stuck in a very small section of the espionage universe and i can do what i like within that small section of it but i can't do very much else i can't move outside it very much um when reviewers you know look on what i'm doing and say it's like the carré it isn't really but that's if they say that people can understand it you know it becomes a, it's kind of critical speak that um that, that uh, people reading their reviews uh, book reviews will will understand what they're getting at but it's not it's not genuine i'm not a writer like le carré i'm nowhere near as good a writer as le carré and um and i does it, does it feel like the the way i don't want to be you know i'm doing my own thing he did he did his i'm does always it, flattered to be compared to him but I, I i take it with a huge pinch of salt does it feel like a burden sometimes when people make that comparison no it's always it's always flattering i'm not uh, it doesn't doesn't worry me okay all right. Well, there's another, you know, wonderful British spy writers, Charles Cummings, for example. Oh, I yeah, yeah. And I'm so glad you mentioned John Lawton because I think Blackout is just a fabulous book. It might, it's way back in the beginning, but it's about the difficulty of serving in the police in London while war mm-hmm. is on and he's not in uniform. So, I mean, there are many complications. And it's yeah. interesting, you know, John, you're bringing that up, why, why you have taken off, you know, in a way that some of these guys have not. And I don't think that we can ever overlook the power of television. I say that as the Outlander bookstore. I mean, you know, there's just, there's no way that um, that we can ignore, right, Patrick, the effect of, um, of Outlander on, you know, the book. In the same way that Morse, I mean, honestly, at least in the America, hardly anyone read Colin Dexter until, mm. until Morse came along, you know, and then bang i mean it was it just was a transformative kind of a thing so you're like patrick you haven't asked any questions it's your turn oh my turn okay well um you know i'm just echoing what john was bringing up you know part of part of the uh the enjoyment for me is just reading sentence to sentence to sentence in these books and uh you know how beautiful the writing is and how it, it looks like i know it's an awful lot of hard work uh, but it looks like you're having a lot of fun in the writing itself. And uh, I just want to go back real quickly to the badger. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's the first sentence of the book. And we know, of course, that our uh, our poor character here is going to experience that badger again very soon. And I just want to read this paragraph. I, I marked it and it, I was laughing out loud. Uh, it was the dead badger. He'd not been aware he was approaching its ambit. And even now couldn't tell how close he was. It had gathered power since he'd first encountered it. 
its atmosphere expanding like an untended chemistry experiment. And his eyes began to stream, his head to fill. I love this part. Uh, the worst smell in the world. He'd undersold it, calling it that. It was the smell of an afterlife gone bad. All the disappointments of eternity balled up into a single sensation and delivered with the subtlety of a shuttle in the face, a shovel in the face. Wonderful stuff. Um, Thank you. Okay. And the book is just full of that. Uh, but I wanted to ask you really quickly, there are a lot of great little minor characters. And one that really I, I found fascinating was this character, Neezer, who kind of, uh, in, in, can you talk about him a little bit in the, in the kind of squatters community, I guess, that he lives in, in this small village? Well, he, um, he doesn't really have much of a, a role to play, particularly. He's only in that one scene. Uh, but I don't like having characters in books who, who are there purely functionally, um, you know, as if there was some kind of postman, you know, they just turn up, deliver their message and then, and then go away again. I like to try and bring a little bit of life to any character who's going to be there. So he's someone I did think about a great deal. And I end up having him playing imaginary guitars, don't I? He's... Um, yeah, he doesn't have any guitars, he just has books he's on He's just guitar. books on how to look at. Yeah, yeah, so that by the time he's finished reading all those books, he'll be able to pick up a guitar and just play it because he'll know how to do it properly. And uh, that kind of madness just seemed to be a, an appropriate... Um, John and I can uh, both relate to that, I think. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just a way of, uh, of making this character memorable, I suppose, and a, and a bit out of the ordinary. But as Call, I say... Calls yeah, everybody he's... squire. Calls everybody squire, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like the fact that he, uh, he he figures that if he knows the theory, <laughs> that he'll yeah, be yeah. he'll be ready. Excellent guitarist, right? From well, the who's who's to say that he's wrong? Maybe it does work that way. I don't no, know. He's, he's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, he's an idiot. But I mean, you know, it's like it's a, it, we haven't uh, really talked about this, and I know we're just about out of time. But a big, you know, massive part of this book deals with a uh, sort of the buried history of this case that goes back almost thirty years. Uh, to the, the early to mid 90s in Berlin. And I don't want to give any spoilers by talking about that, but that's established pretty early on. Um, can you talk maybe just a little bit about that? Um, I suppose Berlin is the, the heart of the espionage world. I mean, it was where the, the Cold War was was centered really. And um, certainly if like me, you've, you've read and, and um, read many times over Le Carre's novels, you know that that's the, the focal point of so much of what went on uh, in, the, in the battle between East and West as it was fought in the um, second half of the 20th century. And it's not that I'd always felt, oh, sooner or later, I'm gonna end up writing about that place. But as soon as it occurred to me to do so, it, it felt inevitable. I felt you know really, really drawn to it. And um, I, I don't know Berlin very well. I've been there a few times and I wasn't there at the time that I'm, I'm writing about. So what I was interested in was um, trying to recreate the feeling of being in a, the, the newly unified city. There was still, where well, the wounds hadn't healed yet, you know, it was a, um, a the, the wall was no longer there, but the space where the wall was was still very, very visible and everybody's kind of tiptoeing around it, as it were. Um, so it was really writing about people not having gotten used to this new world that they were in yet. And uh, many of them are still fighting the same old battles, uh, which in a way we've, I suppose, we've continued doing ever since. Right. So it was, you know, it, it, I enjoyed writing those scenes very much, uh, which surprised me because I thought there were going to be a lot of hard work uh, because I don't normally write outside of my own time period. I don't normally write um, in a foreign city, you know, I'm normally observing what's going on around me in, in London or, or wherever and kind of translating that to the page. This was more of an imaginative journey than I would normally make and I enjoyed it very much. It really is, a, you know, it's a perfect entry point for people who've never read your work at all, it seems to me, you know, uh, who haven't read the, the other books in the series. But for those of us who have, yeah, there are lots of uh, lots to be found within the book. Um, Patrick, are there any questions from the audience or any questions from the viewers that yeah. we haven't gotten to? Let's see here. Um, Let me disagree with Patrick for a moment. I think that I think that if this was the first book somebody read, that the whole last section of it would be a mystery to them. <laughs> possibly, maybe so. yeah, possibly. <laughs> maybe, maybe so. Yeah, I mean, I'm going from somebody who has read the other books, so you might be right about that. 
Um, let's see, James asks, uh, this is a two-part question for John. How do you keep everything organized and functional after writing such an incredible number of books? Um, mm -hmm. Does it ever get hard to keep the different storylines straight, particularly with the spinoff series uh, and potential scenarios you may have scrapped? That's interesting. I can say that uh, Davenport in two different novels been shot exactly in the same place in the chest and had this bullet punched through his shoulder blade in exactly the same place. So he should, yes, I have all kinds of trouble keeping that straight. <laughs> and uh, and um, uh, in fact, I don't even care too much if I keep it all straight. Uh, I have a situation in which I liked one character so much uh, that Davenport encountered him when he was, uh, when Davenport was in his early forties. And then I had a flashback book uh, in which Davenport was in his twenties, I put the same character in it just because, just because I like him. So much. <laughs> because he could, because you know, he could. chronologically impossible. But it was fun to do. Yeah, I have a lot of trouble with that. I Mick has written how many books have you written now? He must be close to twenty. Uh, Sixteen full-length novels, I think. I was told this the other day. I haven't counted them myself. Uh, this question. question. I'm sorry. I sometimes have to go back and read over, you know, the series every so often in order to make sure that I'm not making huge continuity errors. But like you, I'm not sure I would, I would worry about it very much. My characters are not aging in, in the uh, in, in the same way that the world is. You know, I mean, the first book is what um, 13 years ago now. My characters have not aged 13 years, but they are now in 2023. Regardless, all writers do that sort of thing. It doesn't worry me. So what? Yeah. <laughs> Another question is just uh, when will the next uh, season of Slow Horses come out? I believe towards the end of this year. We're thinking December, but I haven't actually been told that for sure. Uh, but I think that three will be out towards the end of this year, four will be out sometime next year. John, do you have any new uh, TV or movie projects in the works? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, because the fact of the matter is the strike. Uh, no, it's not the strike. I don't care. And I've never cared. I, I did the first book that I had that was made into a movie. I didn't see for four months after it came out because I just don't care. I mean, I'm I'm really a book guy, and um, and uh, you, you know, in some ways, I I envy Mick for the, but it's because of the quality of the of the of the series he got. Uh, mine were junk, and I and I and I resent the fact that they were junk, but there wasn't anything I could do about it in particular. And so I just, uh, I have to say, I don't care very much. Good attitude. I've been extremely lucky with um, with, with uh, the show that's been made, but I can easily see how, how very wrong it could have gone. I can interject and say, because I have a book here and I can count, 16 novels, okay. three novellas, and one collection of stories called Dolphin Junction. And then there was an actual collection of the three novellas. So, you know. Lots of work there. I got yeah, I got some free books out of that one, didn't I? When, yes, you uh, did. They're just binding the old ones together. Yeah. <laughs> That's about it for the audience questions. Great. Anything else for John? Do you have any final question for Mick? How long are you going to keep doing it? As long as I can, John. Same as you. All right. <laughs> I just have to say that one of the real highlights of my literary life was um, was reading Neon Prey and finding that Lucas Davenport was reading one of my books. You can't imagine a thrill I gave you, and I was absolutely delighted. An oh. Easter egg, indeed, so. Well, it's been a joy for us to, you know, walk along with John for most of his career. We feel so lucky that we get to talk to him once or twice or sometimes. I guess, has it ever been three times? Might have been three times one year, I'm trying to recall, but... Well, when I've come, well, like I did two the year that I talked to Mick there, so that would have been three. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I unfortunately missed that. It was one of the sorrows of my life that I was the way and Patrick was the host. Not that it wasn't great for Patrick, but I was really sad. Um, and then yeah. didn't you go to Albuquerque? And for some reason, I had to miss your guest of honor thing in Albuquerque, if I remember. I was in Albuquerque last year. Yeah, I think. I think so. Yeah, and I'll no, be in was, Nashville next year. Yeah, no, it, it was. So I will point out to you, there is a nonstop flight from Heathrow to Phoenix. I'm just going to... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we can learn, maybe we can learn, make back to the store and John could fly over from Santa Fe. I have one last question that I just thought of now. Is your real name Mick? 
It is, yeah. Well, my full name is Michael, but um, yes. That's what I meant. Is, is it Michael? It's Michael, yes. Yeah. So thank, Michael. You for, thank you very much for joining us. Sorry, John. What? Sorry, John. What's going to be on your tombstone? Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, Romulu Nick, I don't know. I don't know. I won't be around. Yeah, I won't be in a position to uh, to Here. determine that. Okay. <laughs> Only I told you I was going to actually ask that question. Yeah, <laughs> I have to love it. Anyway, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you again for your patience in the delay of an hour for which I take responsibility. But the good news is that you can watch this in your own time again, and you can recommend it to people. There will be a podcast available, I hope, by Sunday. Um, and so people can listen to it as well. Anyway, the book is The Secret Hours. Um, Congratulations, Mick, and I hope that you enjoy your publication, your two publication days. <laughs> right. So, bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye, for Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Patrick. Take John, care. thank you so much. Yeah. Bye,